was a part of the Highland Round all the way back in 2010, uh, back when we had a small office in, uh, in Moneda, downtown. Um, there were 23 of us that first came here, and um, I'm still here. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story, um, and then also talk about what I'm doing today, which is um, I'm a partner at Magma Partners. We're the only fully private investment fund in Chile. Um, we don't take any public money, and we're probably also the most active. So we've invested in 26 companies over the last two and a half years, and I think 11 or 12 have been startup Chile companies. So we really like startup Chile. So um, I'm from originally from Milwaukee and Wisconsin, so close to Chicago. Uh, like I said, I got here in 2010. Previous to coming to Chile in university, I started uh, tickets and textbooks trading marketplace it's called Exchange Hut. I uh, started it on my campus at University of Wisconsin. We expanded across, uh, I think, probably about 12 universities, 150,000 users, um, charging fees for trading textbooks at the end of the semester and buying and selling student football, basketball, and hockey tickets. And this was pre-Facebook before um, you could actually post things for sale on Facebook, so we pretty much had an monopoly. We ended up, after about two, two and a half years, um, selling to a publicly traded company from South Korea. After that, I started a company called The Trusted with a uh, business partner, and this is a company we came to Chile. And this one was a way to access transfer and delete online accounts when somebody dies. So a lot more rewarded than tickets and textbooks, but that's what we did. And so after about a year and a half, uh, we had raised a little bit of money, we had gotten press, we were everywhere, we launched at South by Southwest. We didn't have that many clients, and we were looking to avoid the Wisconsin winter. We were going to move to either San Francisco or to uh, Austin, Texas. When we saw an article of Forbes that said that Chile had this program where we could have basically free money to come for Chile in the summer, avoid Wisconsin winter, and give us a little more runway to figure out what we wanted to do. So we came down here uh, in November 2010, spent the six months, developed our product even farther, pivoted to a business to business model instead of just to be a C model. And went back to the US and ended up selling our company to spin out for the first day. And so I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, and I hadn't really learned much Spanish in the first six months because everything at that point at least was all in English. And so I thought I was kind of dumb that I hadn't learned Spanish after being in the South American country for a while. I came back with the idea of learning Spanish and then just started sort of seeing what other opportunities there were to do um, startups in South America. So I started working for a Chilean startup called Wellgo, which does like event right for South America, which is still around. Um, I was part of the marketing team, and they forced me through probably like nine months of really hard bullying to move in, which I did. And then um, I started being invited to teach entrepreneurship classes at different universities, and uh, ended up basically realizing that I was doing everything that an investor does, except for actually getting money. So I was doing all the mentorship, I was making connections, and I saw that there weren't, there wasn't anybody at the time that was doing uh, investing that had significant experience both in the U.S. and in South America, and that most of the most of the investment opportunity were in government funds accelerators that maybe just gave you money but didn't help them. So um, I went created a plan, started talking to my friends, and basically out of nowhere, a friend of mine uh, connected me to the owner of the family office in Chile that was poor. He'd been doing basically the young company boards for over 20 years and managing his family's money, but he wanted to do something more interesting and also kind of give back for uh, Chilean companies to create some value. And he wanted to invest in companies, do something more interesting. So I pitched him my plan and he shockingly said, yeah, okay, let's do it. Um, and that was about two and a half years ago. We launched Mega Partners, uh, the only, only private investment fund in Chile. So Francisco is here. Um, his family office put the vast majority of the money for our fund. Um, it's a total of $5 million. 
dollars. Um, Diego and I are the other two partners. We also put some of our personal money up. So we have no limited partners, just the three of us. We can make the decision up to the best. We have Bea, who's our, our newest addition. She's our entrepreneur residence. I'm going to bring her up real quick just so you can get to see the chance and she'll say hi real quick. She's probably the best person to talk to um, if you have questions about what we do, how we invest. Um, she's the first person to talk to before. Um, we're going to work with the application folks. I'm going to get just a second here to explain what you guys Okay, so um, my name is Beatriz, like Nate had said. Um, I currently work at Magna Partners as an entrepreneur residence. I am very open to hear your questions, whatever you need. And long story short, uh, after a long run in the corporate world, I ended up meeting with this guy, so I figured it was time for a change. So here I am, Beatrice at Magna Partners. So please feel free to, to talk to Bea, contact her, figure out if you have questions about you know, what we're doing, if we have ideas of um, questions about how to do things in Chile, she's a good person to talk to. So at Magma, we, we like to start with Chile. So um, we told, like I said before, we've invested in 26 companies over the last two and a half years. All but three of them are based in Chile. Uh, we have one in Colombia and two in the States. Uh, this is the newest, the latest version of our portfolio. So you can see probably some of the companies we've invested in you might recognize because of Startup Chile. And so what do we actually do? So we do, we're bringing U.S. style investment and mentorship to Chile. So um, I don't know if you've met any any investment funds here or in Chile or places in Latin America, but many of the attitudes are treating basically startups like you would treat more business. So it's more of a private business. So our, our promise is that we'll use US style investment where we know we want to build value by only taking small percentage of the business, not trying to get control, not asking for board seats, things like that from the very beginning. Uh, we use, we made Chilean, Chilean, Chilean editions of, uh, of text stars and white commentary documents. So we literally just translated them and adapted them for local, local law. Um, you can find them on our website if you want to look at them to figure out um, what they are. We provide really strong mentorship, part of our, uh, part of our goals. So we have an office where um, I think 16 of our, of our companies are all together. Um, we have a very specific process to make sure that um, we're actually providing value rather than just writing a check. And one of the biggest differentiators, beyond the fact that um, I have experience both here in the States, is that Francisco, who put most of the money up, is willing to risk his name and open doors. So that's very rare in, in Chile and Latin American countries in general because of the fear of, of failure. So Francisco is willing to take, we have a business to business company, go to a large business, go to meeting with you and try to help a sale, which is very different from most of uh, the other funds that we've seen. So we do two lines of investment. Yeah. So we do two lines of investment. Our first one is our standard seed. It could be somewhere between $20,000 and $70,000, depending on how much traction you have, how much you need um, going forward. And that generally, the way that will invest is you can apply online, you have a quick form that you fill out. We'll meet with you once or twice, ask questions, ask probably to prepare a little bit more documentation when we have questions. And with pretty quickly, within could be a week or two, we'll have a decision. So our investment committee is just the three of us. We can move very fast. And one of our core principles is that if we do invest and you are doing well, we already sort of have a earmark for you, somewhere between $100,000 and $250,000 a follow-up effort. So if we do a seed investment and you do really well, we're going to be able to invest in follow-up very quickly. So of the 26 companies that we've invested in so far, we've done five follow-ups. So what we've seen is that there isn't a bridge for most companies that are based here from that first maybe seed round, where maybe you can get it from the start of Chile, maybe you can get it from the accelerator or us, but there isn't that 
hundred to hundred fifty thousand dollar round that gets you to being able to raise a large round either here or in the states. Should we try to fill that gap? So like I said before, we know startup's not a bar. So we ask for somewhere between five to fifty percent equity. And never are trying to get more than about 20, even with the bottom. So we're looking for good teams, balanced teams that have an unfair advantage, that fit our investment pieces, and uh, have a scale of business point. So what's an unfair advantage? We want you guys to either know something special about the industry, have a special skill, something that makes you the best team in the world or the best team locally. Yeah. We invest in two very specific niches. Uh, we invest in business to business companies in Latin America. We'll talk a little bit more about why after. Um, and we invest in companies that use their back office here or somewhere else in Latin America to sell into developed markets. So whether it's the US and Europe where we have the most connections or potentially into Asia. And we really look for, for in, the first, uh, in the first group, the businesses that have um, improvements to efficiency in the company processes. We have a, a rule that we like to invest only in companies that have depended for a real business model. By a real business model, we mean not as good. We don't think that those are necessarily bad businesses, but our view is that you need way more capital to be able to, to execute something like that. And there isn't just that access to capital in, in Latin America. You don't have to go to the States and raise a new round to do it. The chances that happening are a lot lower, so we try to speak here. So, if you take nothing else from uh, what I talked about today, if you're thinking of raising money in the States, this is it. Um, we have gone to the States with our Latin American companies to raise money, and these are the, the three number one things that all funds will ask for. I need you to be incorporated in either Delaware C or LLC, either one is fine. You'll need to have at least a couple of sales in the United States, even if you have uh, sales in Latin America that are doing really well. And you'll need some sort of direct introduction, unless you get really lucky. And the reason for this is not that there's bad businesses or that you know people are discriminating against companies from Latin America or whatever it is. It's just that in the States, there's so much deal flow that all of the funds get every day, it just doesn't make sense for them to even think about something that's not in their, um, in their direct line. So for example, Brad Bell from Foundry Group, who also is one of the co-founders of Techstars, their first build rates are already based in the United States, with the Delaware LLC, or so you're not going to look at it. So you could have a business that's selling millions of dollars in Asia, Europe, or South America, they're just not going to hear So, very simple to open up a company in the States, even if you're just doing business in South America or somewhere else. You can probably find a lawyer that will do it for you for between three and seven thousand dollars. So, if you are thinking about raising money in the States, you should do it. Um, having even one or two sales in the United States with a lot of traction in South America is really helpful. So, if you're doing a business that you think is going to be worldwide, or could be something where you want to move to the States or move to, to Europe, start calling and get a client with you. Even if they're not paying a lot, just the fact that somebody in the US said, yes, I want this, I see value, makes you go way up in the US investor. Investor's eyes. And then the next piece is a lot of people think that basically just writing into investors is the best way to do it. But if you look at the deals that we do and the deals that most funds in the States do, they're going to come, yeah, they probably wrote an email link, but they're also going to come from somebody saying, hey, you know, I know this person, um, at least take a look. And so, U.S. is probably even more skewed towards the introduction, and the best way to do that is to go onto your LinkedIn or use one of the um, email plugins that shows you have a comment, and they say, hey, can you write me a, a quick intro? Uh, it doesn't even have to be like, I know this person, they're amazing. It can just be very simple. Hey, we met back a while back at a conference, what they're doing at school, and they um, And this, this, added, this quote down here is more of an attitude. Um, a lot of, it's the thing we see a lot of entrepreneurs get wrong. Um, many people come to us and say, no, I really want this valuation, I really want this, um, I want this amount of money. When it's more for an ego 
piece is, is ego trips rather than why, right? So we'll go through and figure out figure that out. So when you look at what uh, what Brad Feld and Jay go on to say, pop on pop investors in the states. Number one thing you can say to an investor when uh, they ask me any what valuation you want, we don't really care so much about the valuation. We're not going to let it get in the way of uh, mining a good part. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean you're away from the company or you can make some deal, but be open that if you really think someone's going to provide value for your, for your business, the valuation of a million here, a million there shouldn't have that. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about doing business in Latin America. Uh, how many people are doing sales in Latin America? And how many people of that are from Latin America? It's about half and half. So, doing sales in Latin America, if you're not from here, is very difficult. And it's a process you have to learn. So, they say that you know, stoppers eating the world. Well, if that's true, Latin America is deserved because we have not gotten anywhere near the big ones. And we see every day we'll find we're just being with one of our, our portfolio companies. There's a multi billion dollar sales company that does the entire inventory system with a guy with a clipboard and a cell phone. And that's a massive opportunity, and many companies in Latin America still have it. Another reason that we're doing business to business instead of B2C in Latin America is the distribution of data. So if you look at who can actually buy a B2C product, in Latin America. Chile is actually one of the better ones in Latin America. There's only, kind of hard to see, but there's only about 20 to 25 percent of all of Chile that can be a good client for the software product B2B unless you're going to massive scale. So that doesn't mean that Chile and other Latin American countries are poor countries. They're not. It's just that most of the money is, is with big So. We don't, obviously we don't like this, but we see that it's a fact, and if you're going to be a, an entrepreneur, we think that going after big businesses is probably the best strategy. So these are a couple of examples of companies that we've invested in that do need to be in Latin America. Um, some of these are our portfolio ones, others are uh, just the ones we've seen. So for example, pricing companies in our portfolio, um, what they do is they give pricing analytics data to big retailers like Falabella or Sample Street or things like that. And they're replacing, sending a guy with a clipboard writing down the prices of all the toilet paper, all the in, having mistakes. They do it by scraping on them. Very simple business. They sell multiple millions a year and clients all over South America. Another good example is one that we didn't invest in. Um, and what they're doing amazing is my hotel. They give back office software for hotels. Thousands and thousands and thousands of hotels all across Latin America. Only, I think, about 30% of them are even online today. So it's a massive opportunity to be able to do something where it's clearly money, it's moving, people are willing to pay. The other companies that we invest in. Um, and the other opportunity that we see are companies that have their back office here but do business in the States. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that when you're first getting started here, the costs are so much less than being in a U.S. startup. So, for example, Property Simple is probably the star company in our portfolio. X Startup Chile, I think, around one. Um, they have an office now in, in Los Angeles and they have their back office here. And when we went to raise the round that we just closed down in California, People would say, well, what's your burn rate? And we'd say, well, you know, it's about $100,000 to $150,000. And they'd be like, oh, wow, we must have a lot of sales. Or a big investment. And we're like, no, that's for the entire year. And they, they didn't believe us. They were like, there's no way that that's possible because of the level of tech that you guys have and what we see from other, uh, other companies in the States that are burning that much a month or more. So it's a massive advantage. You can find product market fit being here and then jump to the States. So we say, you know, Chilean costs with US sales. Um, another, another really good example is one of our newest uh, investments is uh, Chile now, the investment we're making new about there. Um, they joined up recently within the last couple of weeks, and they're the perfect example. Super lean team here with clients in the States. 
US is the market. We can charge probably five to ten times more selling it to the state with the exact same product. The problem with the sales is going to be easier because people are more willing to pay. So, one of the reasons we don't invest in social, like I said, is that it needs so much more capital. So, if you have something social, you probably should, after you finish the program, you can jump back to the state. Because you're going to need round after round of capital to get back to the rest of you. And it's going to be much, much, much harder for you to do. So, I'm just going to skip through that one and go on to do some tips for maybe some cultural differences of doing sales in Latin America and working here. Um, how many of the people that are doing sales here that are uh, from Latin America are not Chilean? Alright, so probably there's a lot of cultural differences too between uh, the different countries. But what we've seen, um, a lot of these tips are mostly, mostly Chile, Chile related, so hopefully they're helpful and they can flow here. Uh, the number one thing, and this is true everywhere, is, is focus. Um, it's hard to get anything done, and so if you're pushing five things at once, rather than just one thing, it's much more hard. We, we always talk about, I only talk about the lead domino, so what's the one thing that you can be working on that makes every other thing that you want to get done easier? Think about what that is and work on it. That's part of um, every week, we're going to ask our, our startups, are you pushing the lead domino, what is it? Has it changed? And that's the number one thing that, uh, that we think we should be looking at. <laughs> so, a big thing from, from South America, especially, because it's not that many companies yet, is that press really means nothing. In the States, it means nothing, but here, here it's even more. Um, and I use my own example from the Trusted as uh, the best example here. So, we literally were in probably every newspaper in the world, probably every blog that you could think of. Literally, almost every single one. Um, and this is before we had probably even $1,000 for everything. Everybody from outside thought we were doing amazing, that we were going to be this next massive company. But if you look inside, we had nothing. Absolutely nothing. And it's even more true in Latin America. You look at, you know, every Monday, our Corio has to fill an entire 12 pages with startup stuff. Every, I think, Wednesday or Thursday, it's... Uh, uh, everybody has to fill the space. There's not that many companies. So you'll find lots and lots of companies that get in the press and there's still nothing. They're still getting in the press two or three years later. So, <coughs> so don't let the press get to your head. Think that because you got in there, you have something good, or because these other guys are in there, that means that they have to So this is one we see. A lot of especially foreign entrepreneurs uh, get wrong, um, where people try to copy something that they've seen in the US or Europe and bring it here. Um, being early is the exact same thing as being wrong. Uh, and trust it, same thing. Even though we sold it, it did fine. It's just starting now, about 12 years later, to be something that more and more people are talking about and big companies are starting to do. So, coming to Latin America with a technology that works in the States and expecting it to work, even modifying it a little bit, it can be really tough. So make sure that the, the culture is ready for the business that you're trying to do. So this is a very basic one. If you're trying to do business here, learn Spanish. There's plenty of people, there's plenty of people that speak English, but sales are hard enough as it is. They don't want to give the person one extra little chance of saying no just because they're just too lazy to hear this in new English or they're ashamed of how they speak English or whatever it is. So learn Spanish, even if it's just like very basic, it's going to help really a lot. So this goes back to the being early and the same as being wrong. If you're cloning, don't literally just copy what you've seen work in the States. You're going to have to figure out a local model. And a pretty simple example of that is um, in e-commerce, for example. We worked with a couple of e-commerce companies maybe two years ago, and they were trying to copy something that was working in the States. But for here, between shipping and payments, they were completely different. So we had to adapt to the local market where people could pay offline without a credit card uh, or a one card. So it took probably six months to implement that system, and then the business started to work. 
So really think about and investigate each uh, hypothesis of how the U.S. business works or the European business works, and you're going to copy it here. So, and this works offline too. You know, you look maybe 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, when Starbucks tried to move to into Argentina, they failed miserably because they did exactly what they did in the United States. I mean, just nobody liked it. Argentina's got a great coffee culture, it works. So, they had to rethink everything, change a lot, and now they're finally starting to move a little bit better. So, one big change from um, Latin America compared to the States is that in the US, if you come into a big company and you're making a sale, the, the person that you're talking to, if they pass on your opportunity and you go to competition and it becomes an amazing idea, that person might get fired for passing on your idea, for not taking the risk to try something new. In Latin America, the exact opposite. If they try you, and it doesn't work. They're going to get yelled at by their boss and they might get fired. So, what we found is that if you go in pitching, my product does this, it will save your company this, it's much, much, much less likely to work unless you find somebody who's either having a good day or wants to really take a risk. So the number one thing that you have to do when you're coming into a big uh, Latin American business is to show the person that you're selling to that you can do this without taking a big personal risk. And if it doesn't work, you're not going to be the one who gets blamed for fighting. And we've seen this at work in two and a half years of doing B2B sales. Um, one of our companies had, with, using the company's own data, it made that company about $6 million a year. But it sort of stepped on the toes of a couple of the higher executives. And they weren't willing to say, yeah, you know, this makes $6 million for the bank. But I'm taking a personal risk. They said no, they cut the program, and that was it. So selling with numbers doesn't always work. So you gotta really think about um, the psychology of it. It's a big change, especially for people from the US, where you go in there with your numbers, and all you do is say, look, this is gonna make the X amount of money, it's gonna save X amount of time. Not generally the best way to do it. That comes in with step two or step three, once the person's realized that, yeah, they're not gonna get fired when they get the risk. Um, the other thing is yes doesn't always mean yes. It mean yes, it mean no, it mean maybe. So if you're a foreigner, get, get used to it. Again, coming from the States or Europe, um, a lot of people will have that this first idea that in you know, Latin America is just one big thing. Then they'll think, well, okay, maybe it's Brazil and the Spanish speaking side. No. You, know, you really have to know that it's not as simple as, okay, I'm going to get my start in Chile, it's going to work, and then I'm going to jump to Peru, I'm going to jump to Colombia, and do the exact same thing. The business culture in each country is completely different. So you may have to modify your B2B products um, substantially if you're taking a jump from Chile to Colombia or to Mexico. And the culture of getting things done, the way you reward country manager, it's all different. So you got to get it out of your head. head. Um, it's going to be fast and easy to jump from this country. Even stuff as simple as words. So when I was working with, with Welcome doing ticketing, we had to change, when we opened up Argentina, I said to change all the words to be an Argentine Spanish. And when we went to Colombia, we had to change everything from two to instead. We had to change, like, here in Chala is the ticket, and in Colombia is the word, and you just go through and do everything. So, it can take a lot more time than anyone might think. So, another big piece is if you're thinking about raising money, or if you're thinking about doing business here, Latin America is still is not so developed. And there's two reasons, the two big, two big things you should know. One is just because of the few, the few amount of funds that are active and using US style investments. In all Latin America, including, uh, including Brazil, there's probably only about 10, maybe 12 that are really like actually active in this stuff. So the amount of deals that get done are a lot smaller. Then the second piece is that exits are much harder. So if you look at the, the best exits from Latin America, you're getting multiples on sales of like 2 to 3x maximum. Whereas in the States, a SaaS company is going to be worth somewhere between, it was six months ago, say, 8 to 12x. 
And today it might be four to six X, um, just for the else. In Latin America, that might be like 1.5 to 2x. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that there's not that many startups with big amounts of venture capital that they buy you. And then two, most of the large businesses here, even the public ones, the public piece is tiny. And it's still controlled by families. And it's a completely different thing to say, I'm going to buy this startup for $25 million and it's going to be public market capital or my investor's money than saying, Okay, I'm going to be with my family. Am I going to take $25 million out of my pocket that's going to go away from my kids' inheritance and buy this tech company that maybe only has $100,000 of sales? Say, well, we really need this, but you know, maybe I'm going to negotiate a lot harder to buy it for $2 million or for $3 million. So the multiples in Latin America are a lot less. So you have a solely Latin American company as an investor. When we invest, we need to see the possibility of getting 10 to 20x on our investment because 80% of our portfolio is probably going to fail. So when you run the numbers backwards and say, okay, we're going to only get 2x or 3x uh, sales in a, really good, in a really good company, and the sales are going to top out at, say, 10 million a year. The best, 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 best case scenario is going to be this company is going to be worth $30 million. So if you come in with a $5 million valuation, it's just not going to work. And if as an investor, you're not going to make any money investing in, you know, three, four, five million dollar valuations in Latin America companies that are making sense of Latin America. So as a founder, you need to keep that mental calculus there, that if you're going to be raising private money, um, if you're going to be going for exits in Latin America, that's the reality. And the third piece is the big businesses still aren't buying that because they're not scared. So they haven't seen, Latin American businesses haven't seen Amazon kill all the booksellers in the United States. They haven't seen, um, you know, Netflix kill all movie stores. You know, there were blockbusters even five years ago here, but way, way fewer. They didn't see low three people getting thrown out of business from tech. Um, that will happen, and I think mean, it's we're just on the cusp of, of that to start, but the big businesses aren't scared yet. So um, they're much less likely to buy it to try to do a defensive acquisition. So that was uh, that's what I have for it so far. Um, if you have questions, please feel free. Um, how are we on time? We have like 10 or 15 more minutes to ask questions. Um, if you have any, so. Feel free. Go ahead. Um, so I noticed that you guys are a privately funded fund. What's your strategy for potential money on your investments? Based on all the excess Why would you like? That's not really going to happen. So we have well, two. The question was what's our strategy if we're fully private to actually make money? Um, there's two. One is that for Latin American businesses, we try to get in as the first check, where we can probably get a good valuation that makes sense. So if we know that the best company is going to sell maybe 15, 20, 30 million dollars, um, we can get in at a valuation that fits our 10 to 20x fit. The other thing too is that for Latin American B2B companies, they can be cash cows. So we have one company where we invested, say, a year and a half ago that went from, I think, $30,000 in sales, and now they're in multiple millions. Um, you know, if we can't, if we can't sell that to somebody, it's okay, because we're going to make really good cash with it. It's obviously not what we want to do, but the way that we're investing for Latin America, it works. The other big piece is that we really want the other half of the portfolio to have a back office here in the United States. That's where we think we're going to make the and then also as, as time goes on, there are going to be some local companies that I think we can convince to, to buy some of our companies. And then also, as more and more foreign companies see that Latin America is sort of the last frontier where they can expand, um, if we have stuff that's working, then we can make some sales as well. So the question was, what's the average sales cycle for B2B clients 
in jail. And so we've seen everywhere from one company has like probably a nine month, two and a half year sales cycle, um, where the two and a half year one was, they went in, the company said, we love it. They said, sorry, we're just gonna do it ourselves. They tried it for a year, completely failed. They wasted, you know, we think somewhere around $2 million trying to copy what they did. And then they just came back now and said, okay, yeah. Um, that, that attitude is pretty common, where you'll say, no, yeah, we're just going to do this. And then they completely fail, and then they come back. Um, for, for products that are like, I would say, $25,000 a year and up, um, we have at least two to three month sales cycles for those, but usually pretty, pretty long. For some smaller stuff, it can be fast if it really, really is solves a need and is less than say like five thousand dollars a year it can be really pretty fast. But anything like big sales, twenty five K and up, it's gonna take a long time. Anyone else? Yeah. Sure, so the question was, how do we determine the 5 to 15% equity? Um, generally, it's a combination of, are they going to be selling just in Latin America, or are they going to be attacking the US and European market? Um, that's one piece. So what's the total market size? Can we, can we make that um, you know, 10 to 20x calculation make sense from if they do really, really well, what will this be worth? So if the market size and the potential sale price is going to be lower because they're just in Latin America, then we're going to be closer to that 15. Um, if they're going to the States, we're getting much closer to the 5. Also, traction. So, you know, completely different story. If you've got, you know, $20,000 of recurring revenue versus, you know, you have one guy doing a trial somewhere, um, not paid. You know, so the more traction, more sales you have, the less equity we're going to ask for. Um, and then, yeah, those are the, the two things. So the question was, are there requirements to be an angel investor to get money? So no, there's nothing. And uh, so if you're if you're looking uh, to see what angels are out there, you think maybe you're not ready for. Um, someone like us, there's one of our portfolio companies is called Founderless, which is a direct copy of Angelus for Latin America. So we have um, something like 40 angels in Chile, and we have, I think, about 10 in Colombia um, that are willing to look at deals. So make your, you should all make your, your profile on Founderless. It's founderless.la. Um, and at a, the worst case scenario, you'll get looked at by you know, 20 or 30 angels and maybe someone really interested. If you're looking for U.S. market, it goes to the way, place to be, but for Latin American stuff, um, we think that uh, Honorless is a really good option. And it does the exact same thing. It's got the whole you know, investment docs for, for Chile. We're doing Colombia right now. Then we've got to pay. Then we're checking out. So, the question was, is there a bubble in the world and in the FM startups? Um, I think that the local case, I wouldn't call it a bubble, but I would say that if you compare how the startup community was in 2010 when I first got here to where it is today, in 2010 it was like, if you said, oh, I have my own business, I'm an entrepreneur, it's like, you're jobless, homeless, doing nothing. Today it's now, everybody thinks it's cool. I think it's gone too far so that everyone thinks it's cool. So we see a lot of uh, a lot of entrepreneurs or we came up with the word the word chunkpreneurs. The guys who are just in there for you know, they want to be in the paper, they want to be famous. Um, they probably go con contest to contest to contest. They might have got a startup too, they might have got a, an incubator, but they maybe want a bank competition, they want this, they want that. They can go three, four years without making a sale. And so I think that those first crop of people that got in it because they want to be cool are just starting to pop now um, that they started maybe two years ago, three years ago. Um, so I think you'll have not a bubble like what happened in the US in 
of seven in the 90s. But you will have a backlash, I think, with some of the, the people that got it and thinking, hearing that, oh yeah, it's amazing, it's awesome to be an entrepreneur, you're a rock star, you do it, all this sort of stuff. And then they find the reality is that, you know, the real thing is you're in the kitchen every day with your hand on the burner, and there's a guy who is laughing, right? So um, I think that's true. In the States, I would say bubble is not the right word because um, the overinflation is mostly in the public com the, the companies that should be public. So late stage things like you know Uber can raise three billion from Saudi Arabia at some crazy number. It's probably something not, not right. Um, and what we saw in the last six months raising money in California was that a lot of a lot of valuations went down for early stage where you might be able to raise a round with a million dollars to half a million and a half of monthly recurring revenue in SaaS. Now they're asking for three. And the valuation, instead of being eight to 12 X, might be four to six. But you still get money. If you've got something, you can still go in there. Thank you so much. Please, a round of applause.